Now let's talk about how we study uh, viruses using the infectious cycle as a tool. And what we, what we do in, in virus laboratories is to use what's called a one-step growth cycle. And this is a technique developed in the 30s by, again, bacteriophage virologists. And in particular, Max Delbrook and Ellis, Emery Ellis, uh, published this in 1939 where they showed how do you do a one-step growth curve or growth cycle on bacteriophages of E. coli. Now, Max Delbrook was a physicist who came to biology. He got interested in biology and then came to virology in particular because he could make it quantitative as he was used to in, in studying physics. So he developed this one-step growth cycle. And what he would do, he would take a culture of, of E. coli, shown here, the blue cell, he would then take a, a culture of phage and he would absorb the phage to E. coli, in other words, allow the phage to attach. And then he would dilute the culture so no more adsorption occurred. And so you make a dilute culture, so now the likelihood that a phage is going to attach to a bacteria is very low. And now you incubate the culture and you take samples at different times after adsorption and you measure virus infectivity by plaque assay. Now, what did he get when he did this experiment? On the left is a graph showing uh, the results that he got when he, s he infected all the cells in a culture. So he put a lot of virus in so every cell would be infectious. So we're measuring with time the number of infectious particles produced. So you can see initially when he, just after adsorption and he dilutes the culture, for a period of time he didn't detect any virus infectivity no plaques are formed uh, from, these, from these infected phage, uh, bacteria. He called this the eclipse period because it was a period during which no, no infectivity could be detected. And then the number of infectious particles would begin to rise. They rose rather quickly and plateaued. He called that the burst or yield. He called it burst because it happened very quickly in, in bacteriophages. And it's a, it's a term that has stuck even though for many viruses uh, the burst period is much longer. So what's happened here is that the virus are infecting the cells. They're making the parts during the eclipse period to make new virions. And then once the parts are assembled, then the viruses are formed and they're infectious. So you can't detect any infectivity while the parts are being made because there's no infectious virus yet. And then once the parts are assembled, you get infectious viruses. Now this is the situation on the left when you infect all the cells in a culture. Sometimes he did experiments where a few cells in the culture were infected and then he got the pattern shown on the right. The same growth cycle measuring with time the number of infectious particles. You can see the dilution of the culture at the start. You have an eclipse period, then a burst, but then a plateau and a second burst. That's because you have multiple cycles of infection going on here. In other words, you only infect a few cells. You have a few cells infected, they go through an eclipse period, they make virus, and then that virus that comes out of those initially infected cells goes on and infects other cells in the culture. There's an eclipse period there, and then a burst where the second cells produce virus. And if you dilute the inoculum greatly, you can have multiple uh, bursts. All right, so this was subsequently adapted to animal virus infected cells, and that's the, an experiment shown here. So this is a, a growth cycle of adenovirus in a mammalian cell culture. Adenovirus is a rather large DNA-containing virus. Uh, and again, you infect cells, you allow virus to absorb, uh, you then dilute the culture, and you take samples at different hours after adsorption and measure plaque-forming units per mil. And again, you see there's an eclipse period where you can't detect any viral infectivity. Now, in this experiment, we've done one thing different from the previous one, which was the phage bacteria infection experiment. Here, we are measuring both intracellular and extracellular virus. So what you can do in these growth cycle experiments, at each time point, you can remove the cells from the medium and measure the virus inside the cells, simply by cracking them open. Or you can measure the virus in the medium that is the virus that's been released to the cells, and that's what's shown here, extracellular virus versus intracellular virus. 
So the eclipse period you see is shown on the intracellular virus curve. Then there's a rise in the production of virus particles and eventually a plateau. But if you look at the extracellular production of virus, there is no virus outside of the cell until after 16 hours post-infection. And that allowed investigators to define another period called the latent period. That is the period during infection when no virus is released from the cell. So the eclipse period is the time when there is no virus produced at all inside of the cell. And then there's a period uh, between 12 and 16 hours where viruses are being made, but they're not yet released from the cell. That's the latent period. Now again, the, the important point here is that virus multiplication is fundamentally different from the way bacteria multiply. When bacteria multiply by binary fission, one bacterium becomes two, four, uh, eight, and so forth they divide by binary fission. So if you inoculate a culture with bacteria, there's no lag or a very small lag uh, and then uh, immediate growth. So there's no eclipse period during which you don't find bacteria. There are always bacteria present. They're simply dividing. And again, just to go back with viruses, remember there's an eclipse period during which you can't detect any infectivity. That's because new viruses are being made by making the parts and then putting the parts together. A fundamental difference between virus and bacteria. Viruses assemble by making the individual parts and putting them together. Bacteria divide by binary fission. And this confused scientists for many years because they assumed that viruses and bacteria would be similar. And it wasn't until Luria, sorry, Ellis and Delbruck uh, developed this one-step growth analysis that it became clear because of this eclipse period that viruses were fundamentally different than bacteria. Now, when we do these one-step growth studies, we infect all the cells so that they go through the cycle at the same time. That is the key to these growth cycles. It's what we call synchronous infection. In other words, you have to infect all the cells so they go through the cycle all at the same time. So you get sort of a magnification of what goes on in a single cell by the whole culture. You're looking at the, a population of cells all doing something at the same time, so it makes it easier to see what's going on. If every cell was at a different part of the cycle, it would be hopelessly confusing. So how do you know that we have infected all of the cells? That's the key here. So for this, we need to do a little mathematics. And this has to do with what we call the multiplicity of infection, MOI is simply the number of particles added per cell. It is not the number of particles that each cell receives. We'll, we'll see in a moment how you figure that out. So for example, if we have a million cells and we add 10 million virions or virus particles to those cells, the MOI is 10. It's simply a division of 10 to the seventh by 10 to the sixth. This does not mean that each cell will get 10 virions. In other words, it doesn't mean, an MOI of 10 does not mean that every cell will have 10 virions attached to it and get in. That is determined by a, a mathematical calculation. The reason for that is that the infection of cells by viruses is a random event. It depends on collision of viruses and cells happening randomly. You add virus to cells, they're moving around, and sometimes they will hit cells and sometimes they won't. So when you mix cells with virus, and here the word susceptible comes up, that means they have a receptor on their surface. Some cells will not be infected, some will get one particle, some will get two, some will get three or more. Think of it this way, we have a hundred buckets in a room and you have a hundred tennis balls in your hand. If you could throw them all at once, every bucket would not receive one tennis ball because where they're going is a random event. Some buckets would get no balls, some would get one, two, or three. The mathematical equation that we can use to figure out how many virus particles each cell receives is the Poisson distribution. This is a distribution that uh, can inform us about low frequency events like this. Here's the Poisson equation. Uh, PK is simply the fraction of cells infected by K virus particles. That's what we want to find out. 
how many cells get how many virus particles. And the way you do that is you use this equation, e to the minus m. m is the multiplicity of infection. Uh, and k, again, is, is the, the number of virus particles. So it's e to the minus m, m to the k power over k factorial. So we can simplify this and show you some of the examples here. For example, uninfected cells is P0. That simplifies to e to the minus m. Cells receiving one particle, P1, is e to the m times e to the minus m. And multiply infected cells, P greater than 1, can be calculated by this formula. So for any multiplicity, 1, 0 0.1, 10, 5, 100, you simply put the multiplicity of infection in, into this equation here. Uh, wherever you see m, you put the multiplicity of, of infection in, and you solve, and you get either the number of uninfected cells, cells receiving one particle, cells multiply infected. You will get it as a fraction, and then you can calculate the number of cells depending on how many you're starting with. So let's see in, in practice how that works. If you infect a million cells with an MOI of 10, and you use the equations from the previous slide, you will determine that 45 cells are uninfected, 450 cells are, receive one particle, and the rest get more than one. So you can see right away that at an MOI of 10, all of your cells are essentially infected, almost a million, subtracting uh, 45 plus 450. And so that's why if you want to synchronize infection in a culture, you use a high MOI, 10. You could use 5 as well, but we, we use 10 to be sure. A million cells infected at an MOI of 1, 37% of the cells are infected. So about a third of the culture is uninfected, and the rest are infected, getting one or more particles. So here you could do a, a, a multi-cycle growth curve. You would have several, you would have an initial production of virus from these uh, infected cells here but 37% of the cells would be uninfected, they would get virus on the next cycle. If you infect a million cells with an MOI of 0 .001, 0 .00, that is, you add 0 .001 PFU per cell, 99.9% .9 of the cells are uninfected, but some are infected. 990 receive one particle, and somewhat less receive more than one particle. So a very small fraction of this culture, this million cell culture, is infected. So you will have many cycles of infection, one, two, three, four, or more, depending on how many particles each infected cell makes. So you can really study multiple cycles if you want, or you can study just one cycle. So multiplicity of infection lets you manipulate uh, your one-step growth cycle.